Hello, this is Eliseo Rodriguez, and this is the Arian Orthodox Church. Today we're going to be talking about eternal punishment. Um, this is a topic that we've been talking about in the Facebook group. It's a very important topic to everyone, and um, it seems like the majority uh, of believers that have voiced their opinion um, have a more annihilationist view. Um, but, uh, obviously we believe a little bit differently here and I want to just give the reasons why, because, um, a lot of people want to believe that the, the hell is an annihilation and everything's kind of destroyed there and that there's no more consciousness there, but I'm going to show you that biblically it doesn't show that. Um, so unending punishment, second death, torment. So we're going to get right into it, starting with uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So what we need to realize about what this verse is saying is that those who are dead, right, many of those who sleep in the dust, of the ground will awake, that they will obviously come back to life, uh, come back into their bodies. Their uh, bodies are going to have their soul within them. They're obviously going to live. These to everlasting life, right? So some of them are going to be to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Now, why would this be a scripture concerning everlasting punishment? Well, it's because it's talking about everlasting contempt. And contempt is a feeling. It's a state of being. So uh, contempt is a state of being. Uh, you can be mature. You can be um, all of these different states of being. Immature, mature, uh, happy, sad. These are all fall into consciousness and a state of being that someone is in. So contempt is, um, for, for us to understand, is contempt is abhorring or kind of like repulsion. See where it says um, meaning from, to repulse or being repulsed by. So they're going to be eternally repulsed by something. Um, so the feeling of repulsion or, you know, disgust is going to be constant. It's an eternal disgusting um, feeling of disgust. Is it disgust towards God? I don't know. Is it a disgust towards themselves and what their choices have been? Possibly. But if we look at what's being said here, that eternal disgust, you know, being disgusted, an eternal uh, state of being disgusted. And so you cannot have an eternal state of being disgusted with something unless you are conscious and alive. So it's interesting that it's not saying, you know, that they're going to be disgusted with themselves or with their sin or with their choices and then die. It's saying it's an eternal, everlasting, nonstop state of being disgusted or unhappy or repulsed by something. Um, and so it's something that we have to look into as far as that state of being. It's not, um, so it's a state of being that they're eternally going to be into. So you have to be alive and conscious because the emotions, the mind, will, and emotions, those things come from your soul. Um, and your soul is where those feelings are produced, and that's where that comes from. And so if you're not conscious, it's impossible for you to feel contempt. It's impossible for you to feel uh, anyway, uh, because uh, you're dead. So in that sense of the word dead. So this is a different kind of death. So... <clears throat> So that's one thing to, to realize. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 15 says, Truly I say to you, 
they will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So I bring this up because someone used a verse earlier talking about, well, see how Sodom and Gomorrah was completely turned to ashes, but they weren't still burning up. And so that's the way God's going to handle uh, this last, the, the lake of fire that, you know, he's going to bring them to ashes and then they're not going to exist anymore. So it sounds like a, a plausible uh, argument, but that's not what it's saying. It's saying that it would be more tolerable. It would be you're a, more able to endure what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah than what's going to happen in the lake of fire. He's saying that it's, you can tolerate, you could possibly tolerate dying and being burned to ashes in Sodom and Gomorrah, like Sodom and Gomorrah, not a problem. But what's going to happen to this city is going to be even, uh, that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah is something that you can endure and experience and, and be happy with. What's going to happen in the future on the judgment is different, is not the same. So that's what it's saying. Tolerable there um, is bearable. It's more bearable the word tolerable in in the Greek, right, it, it, that's being used here, is it saying it's more bearable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment, the way things have gone, the judgment that's gone on Sodom and Gomorrah, than for the city that, that, that's being spoken of in the eternal judgment. It's different. It's different. It's more bearable, that judgment that they had in Sodom and Gomorrah, that being burned up and dying instead of being thrown in the lake of fire, which is different. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so what they experience in Sodom and Gomorrah is not as bad as the lake of fire. It's different. That's the point I'm trying to make here. So it's not saying that it's the same thing, uh, or is it going to be exactly the same? It's different. So it says, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming. This is John 5, 28 through 29. Uh, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And so the issue here, um, because you may not see where it says um, that there is. So, so the complaint is. You're telling me that you're going that God's going to uh, give these people eternal life. In other words, they're never going to die, and uh, that it's wrong. But if you look here, it says that that some of them are going to resurrect to to life, and some of them are going to resurrect to judgment. And so, if they're already dead, and that's the punishment, and that's the ultimate punishment, why wake them up and then punish them again? I mean, and put them back where they were. It's not the same thing. They're being resurrected. They're being brought back to their bodies and to, to be in their bodies because a different kind of punishment is coming. They're already dead. So if that's where they're supposed to be, really there's no need to start judgment and start some new uh, and then throw them back in where they go. It's a meaningless, it would be a meaningless judgment because they're already in that. It's like saying, uh, sending somebody to prison and then calling them out and saying, okay, we're going to, um, uh, you're already dead, you're already, already condemned to be in prison forever, but we're going to pull you out, judge you again, and then throw you back in, um, and you're going to be back in the same prison or the same situation that you were in before. Um, and someone who's sent to jail is obviously there in a holding uh, place and uh, something different. But when they get out um, or come before the judge, it's not the same thing they're coming back to. They're not coming back to the same uh, issue. If they have a judgment that's been set on them, the conditions are different. The, the possibility was that they could have gotten out, that whatever. But once they go back, it's different. They're there for the long haul. They're, you know, they're condemned to death or they're condemned to um, whatever, right? Uh, it's a different thing. So when, you know, God's going to resurrect these people up, it's not for to send them back to the same thing. It's for something different. It's for a different judgment. Otherwise, uh, there's no need to wake them up. They're already there. No, makes no difference to wake them up and then throw them back. 
So giving them something, you're giving them something that they don't already have. There's got to be an additional punishment. You're, you're, they're just in a holding pattern in death until this judgment happens, and then they're getting sent somewhere. So there's no need for God to bring up people if they're already going to be where they're already at. Um, just leave them there, and the, the things should be taken care of. But if they're not, and there's something new happening, then, then there's a different issue altogether. So, uh, and that's what's happening. They're, they're getting a different kind of punishment. So, resurrection, right? The word there used uh, for resurrection of the dead. Uh, resurrection to judgment. So, then we go to Isaiah. Isaiah 66, 24 says, Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be in abhorrence to all mankind. So... It's saying that they will uh, go forth and look on these corpses and that uh, who have transgressed, and their worm is not going to die. Now, it's not talking about a worm that somebody threw in there, their pet worm that was that is not going to die. Um, that's not what's being said there. It's saying because uh, obviously their worm, what is that? You know what I mean? If their pet worm is going to be sent to uh, to die that to, to a place where it will not die and it will burn and it will be quenched that you know that's not a punishment for anybody that their pet worm is in fire and burning and will not be quenched it's not talking about a pet worm of theirs you know that the sinners all have to submit their little worm and throw them in a fire now I'm using this as the most literal sense so you can understand this is absolutely not what it's talking about the worm is them. It is their body, it is their soul, it is their whatever. That substance of theirs that they possess, whatever it is, um, the consciousness, the, um, the body, the, the decision-making, their soul, their mind, will, and emotions, all of that is their worm, is their, is their, their lot in life, I guess, is what you would say. Um, and it will not die. It's not going to die. That what they possess of consciousness, of opinions, of all of that is not going to die. And the fire will not be quenched. So the fire is never going to stop. It's going to be burning something. Um, and that, first of all, the worm doesn't die. And then the fire is never going to be quenched. It's always going to be consuming, consuming, consuming more and more, never ending. Uh, and they will be in abhor abhorrence or, you know, shameful, you know, disgusting thing to all mankind. That's not a pretty picture, but this is what the Bible says. Um, not something that I'm trying to uh, promote. It's just something that the, the way the Bible describes things. Now, it says, now there was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyous joyously living in splendor every day, and a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs uh, which were falling from the rich man's table, beside even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. This is the story of the rich man. Now, I was discussing something with one of the gentlemen about this, and generally he says that the scholars generally agree that this is a parable. Um, but I feel like it's not necessarily a parable um, because first of all he's talking about adultery and a husband and all this other stuff and then he starts telling the story um, doesn't say that he's going to tell a parable then afterwards he doesn't expound and and break down the parable and then the other thing that's uh, um, an issue for me is that he's using uh, Abraham as an example so it's not a symbolic of Abraham like Abraham's symbolism and the name he names this person as Lazarus when um, in most of his other parables he talks about uh, people in just a figurative sense he doesn't give them a name he says you know um, the uh, you know the, the good Samaritan um, you know the the servant the wise servant uh, the you know, the bridegroom and the 
all of that, those are all symbolic, right? The bridesmaids and all that. He's just using kind of terms for positions for people, but not giving them specific names. And I think the reason why he's using a specific name here is because he's talking about a real person uh, named Lazarus. And he's talking about the actual Abraham and he's talking about this actual rich man. Um, so we'll continue reading. It says, now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. So, in Hades, uh, hell, he uh, lifted up his eyes. So, he's still got eyes. He can move his eyes as he wants. Um, he's in torment. That's just where he's at. That's what's going on with him. He could see Abraham. He can see Abraham from where he's at. So, he can see things. He can understand what he's seeing. Um and he can tell distance far away. Um, he recognized people he knew before, Lazarus. Um, and then he says, uh, and he cried out so he can say stuff. He can cry. He can uh, make noise. He can choose to say something. And said, Father Abraham, talking about the literal Abraham, have mercy on me, right? Forgiveness. He's, he's repentant. He's, um, he's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but he's sorry for everything he's where he's at. He's asking for mercy. And he says, uh, send Lazarus so that he may dip the, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue off. So somehow he knew that they had water. He knew that um, that Abraham, who Abraham was, he recognized him somehow. And he realized that he had some kind of authority and asked for this. He remembered what water was, he was parched, he was being affected by this torment. Um, and he says, for I am in agony in this flame. So he is in flame, he's in agony, it's literal uh, torment, all of that. This is what we can get from here. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you're in agony. Um, so he's having a conversation with someone else. He's, uh, you know, asking for things. He has need for things. Uh, Abraham can see him. Abraham can talk back to him. Um, it's not like Abraham can't talk to him. It's, it's, it's possible. He says uh, to remember things. And so he has a memory. He can still remember what happened before. Um, and he's trying to reason with him. Abraham is. And then, uh, and besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm fixed. So that uh, those who wish to come over from here to you would not be able to, and none may cross over from there to us. He said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. So now um, he realizes that he is stuck, that no one can come help him from that other side, and uh, no one from his side can go on the other side. He realizes that he's imprisoned, essentially, and he says, hey, you know what, do me a favor. Why don't you send Lazarus? to my family, um, to my father's house. So he's remembering his father's house. He's remembering, uh, he's concerned for them. He's, he's worried about them. He realizes he doesn't want anyone else to, to suffer like he is. He says, for I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they may not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, the father, uh, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he's saying, well, no, you know, he's trying to reason. He's setting up arguments. He's uh, remembering his brothers. He's, this is consciousness. And the, the question I ask is why in the world would, um, why would someone say, uh, why would, why would Jesus bring this story up and and take up so much time in the story about Abraham and Lazarus and all that stuff. So much content dedicated to hell and it's his situation being uh, in hell and burning and torment and all this other stuff. So much is given. I mean, given all of the verses that it talks about him being rich and him, you know, there's so much given to 
describing in detail the rich man's plight and where he's at and the things he's suffering. And if it's not true, right, let's say that, you know, that the other side is right and it's not true. Why is Jesus bringing this up and telling a story and consequences that are not real? What benefit does anybody in the church anywheres get from a story that's describing something that's absolutely not going to happen? What purpose benefits from that idea? That he, why would he dedicate so much time to, to saying this part and giving it, just say, you know, Abraham and, uh, Abraham and the rich man died and God judged him and said, you know, uh, you're just going to die forever and never exist anymore. And just leave it at that. Why go into so much detail about how he's tormented and how he's burning and how he can tell and remember and want water and ask and plead and so much so much given into this story that is apparently irrelevant and a waste of time. But uh, maybe uh, you have to come to your terms in, in yourself. Why? And, and your answer would have to be for th the theatrical part of it. I don't know. I mean, how would you d describe why Jesus dedicates so much time to this if it's insignificant? I mean, honestly, I don't think that that's what's happening here. Um, so... It says, but he said to him, because he's talking about, you know, if they saw somebody resurrect from the dead, then they would believe. Um, but Abraham says, but he said to him, if they will, uh, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then uh, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. So, um, you know, he's arguing for his own family. He's arguing for. You know, he's conscious, he's remembering, he can see, he can understand, he can recollect, he's in agony, he's in torment. There's a lot of stuff there. And uh, to say that it's just theater and really doesn't reflect. I mean, Jesus is essentially scaring people for no reason with this story, getting into details that are not really going to be happening, according to people who believe in annihilation. So Jesus himself alludes to the endlessness of punishment uh, of the wicked in Mark uh, 9, 47 through 48 says, and if your eye causes you to your downfall, gouge it out. Um, <clears throat> uh, it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm dies not and their fire is not quenched. Back to the verse we were talking about before about the worm not dying. Jesus uses the same verse to describe it's better cut off your hand and send that hand to hell than to burn because that's where the worm doesn't die. That's where, you know, he's using the same verse to talk about what's happening. He's talking about eternal flames, quenching fire that's unquenchable, um, where the their worm dieth not. I mean it's 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 evident. It's not just a He's not just talking about worms here. The, the emphasis of these and similar passages is that the fire in which the wicked are cast inflicts a torment upon them, but the fire does not consume them. That's what's being said here. Okay, so um, Isaiah 33, 14. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Uh, trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who, who among us can live with continual burning? So what are they saying uh, prophetically? What's being said that the, that the people who are, um, they're terrified because um, of the continual consuming fire that's coming, that they're coming to or that are going to come to. And they're worried and fearful of this continual burning. Not that they're worried about burning to death and then dying and then not existing any further. The fearful part of this whole situation, what's in this verse, is that they're worried about dying and burning forever, continually burning. And that is what scares them. That's what's got them trembling. That's what's got them terrified. It's not just dying, because dying is just dying. Um, it's quick, uh, you know, by anybody's standards. Um, even if it, you know, you died slowly, it's not millennia. You know what I mean? So he's talking about continual burning. 
Um, <clears throat> so Jeremiah 17, 4 says, And you will, even of yourself, let go of your inheritance that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which will burn forever. This is more pointing towards the fire being forever, but we know already that he's talking about continual burning. He's talking about where the worm doesn't die. Um, you know, uh, the, the example of the rich man, it's not, it's not, um, you know, not eternal damnation and condemnation and burning. Um, Matthew 18, 8 says, If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet cast into the eternal fire. So obviously that fire is going to be burning forever. They're talking about continual burning. I mean, we, we just add these things up. Matthew 24, 41 says, Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and one will be left. Um, don't actually remember why I put that on there, but whatever. Um, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they, in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example into uh, in un undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So, um, this punishment of eternal fire, that's the, the phraseology there, punishment of eternal fire, that's the punishment, being an eternal fire. The eternal fire is punishment, but it's not punishment if you're dead, you know. Um, it's it's not an eternal punishment if you died right away, you know. I mean, um, it's something that we've got to look into uh, as far as, as what's going on there. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Um away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, eternal destruction um, can be a process, right, of, of, of destruction um, with no end. So uh, to be destroyed eternally is kind of like, you know, uh, giving it the eternal part of it makes it sound like it's never going to end. The destruction or the destroying is never going to end. Um, <clears throat> Jude 6 and angels who did not keep their own domain but a man abandoned their proper abode has he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day eternal bonds um, and you know that this because the, the 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 hell and the lake of fire is all designed for the devil originally and not necessarily for humanity although humanity is that uh, that rejects Jesus is going to go there. Um, the eternal bonds is talking about you know kind of chained down forever, eternally bound, eternally uh, contained. If you die and don't exist any further, you're not in bonds any further. You you're free essentially. You don't exist, so all those things are gone. But to be eternally bound means you're chained or captured or tied to something um, where you don't want to be. And so to be eternally bound means you're eternally, you're always forever connected to something you don't want to be connected to um, eternally. So it's, it's talking about something different. Um, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. So the smoke is not just smoke from the fire, it's smoke of their torment. So if the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, that means that the smoke going up forever and ever is connected to the torment that's happening forever and ever. Because if they're no longer in torment, then the smoke is not any further part of their torment, right? The smoke of their torment. It's not the smoke of their torment after, after they're all dead. It's just smoke afterwards. You know what I'm saying? Um, but if it's the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, then that smoke is symbolic of their torment. And that is going to be going on forever. The smoke is, and their torment is as well, forever and ever. And that's kind of connected together with with that. So just the, 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 the term smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever is saying that this... Um, 
that this torment is being reflected in the smoke and that it's symbolic of, but if they're gone, if they're dead, if they don't exist anymore, if they're just ashes, it's not torment anymore. So the smoke wouldn't be the smoke of their torment forever. It would just be that until they don't feel torment anymore. But if it's forever and ever, I mean, you just got to add it up. It means a lot more. Um, <clears throat> so, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet also are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So day and night uh, is going to be, uh, you know, if you are burning, uh, you would think that you would die right away, right away, meaning, I mean, 10, 10 minutes tops, 20 minutes tops, you're dead in fire. Um, especially a lake of fire, you're not going to live that long. I mean, 10, 10, 20 minutes is stretching it a lot. But let's just say you're really resilient. Um, 20 minutes uh, tops, I'm saying. But this is talking about an entire 24 hours, day and night, they're tormented. That's unusual. That would be unusual for them to be day and night uh, burning and that's may not actually be talking about one day um, could be several days but then again the the you know the the day is eternal after that you know you're not going to have any sun surrounding or cir encircling the earth or any of that stuff that's all gone essentially so um, you know there's a lot of theories uh, for me about what the lake of fire is and what it isn't um, uh, and I can give that right here uh, for a second. We have the universe that we're in right now. Um, obviously, this universe is going to be unused any further. And um, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new universe without any sin or anything like that. If, the, if people uh, who were sinful were cast uh, into this universe and this universe was on fire because God is not using it any further... Um, if this entire universe would be the lake of fire then, um, because it's, you know, the deep, it's the, you know, the water in the deep and all of that. If it were on fire and burning the entire universe and no one's, you know, no one that's in heaven or, you know, in, not heaven like a, a place in heaven, but in the new heaven, new earth and the new universe, uh, that's kind of how I use the word heaven there, um, in the new universe, um, they're all going to be there in that spot and everyone who's cast in the lake of fire, which might be the universe. I'm not saying it is uh, this universe, but if this universe was on fire and burning away. Um, and there's scripture, obviously, that says that everything's going to be destroyed with fervor and heat, the earth and everything else in Hebrews, I believe. Um, but once more, he'll shake it and, and, and all that. If everyone was cast into this universe then, and it was all on fire, then uh, I can understand that it'd be a really huge ginormous lake of fire that is beyond comprehension. Um, and the chasm, the separation between uh, Abraham's bosom, which would be the promises of Abraham, and hell would be the separation between this universe and the new one. But um, all of that aside, that's all theoretical, um, the 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 burning and the fire, the lake of fire and the torment day and night, all of that stuff, um, the eternal day um, that these people in the new universe are going to have, it's going to be one day, it's not going to be any darkness and no night and all this other stuff. Um, if they're waiting on this other side, this uh, on this, uh, in, in the lake of fire, if they're waiting for the night, um, it says on this other side that there is no uh, day, there's no night, there's no darkness at all. Um, they may be waiting forever for the night to come. You know what I'm saying? Uh, they'll be tormented day and night, but if the day is forever, you're never going to see night. You're there forever. Um, um, so, you know, um, things are, are really scary in that area. So, <clears throat> Um, these will go away in eternal punishment. This is Matthew 25, 46. These will go away in eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So kind of two sides of a coin where the eternal, you know, these will go away into eternal punishment and another half of it will go into eternal life. So there's eternal punishment and eternal life. 
life would be having you know a relationship with uh, with God and Jesus and uh, the rest and the angels and uh, all of that and, and eternal punishment is is something different. It's like the the other coin, the other side of the coin. Everyone's going to get resurrected. Um, one's eternal punishment and the other one is eternal life. So it's not ta it's talking about the way that these people are going to live eternally. That's the way this other thing is going to have eternal punishment. It's um, it's deep. So um, let's read here. Several theological concepts have developed in the history of Christian thought that attempt to eliminate or limit the notion of everlasting punishment. One of the more notable of these is annihilationism. This is the idea that human beings are not innately immortal. Immortality, or more properly eternal life, is the gift of God bestowed upon believers. Some forms of this belief, conditional immortality, teach that the wicked simply cease to exist after death. Other forms assert that the wicked may experience a time of punishment after death, but that the person will eventually burn out or cease to exist. They are annihilated. In all its varied forms, this school of thought denies the unending duration of punishment. Two common reasons are typically offered as grounds for denying everlasting punishment. Uh, one of these is that everlasting punishment denies God's eternal love. For God to allow his creature to exist in eternal torment is a contradiction of his loving nature. Another argument against everlasting punishment is that endless torment contradicts God's sovereignty because he allows unbelievers to exist for eternity. As significant as these points are, they both seem to lack any support from the Bible. One of the more significant passages of Scripture that support the doctrine of everlasting punishment and refutes the denials of endless punishment is Matthew 25, 46. In this verse, uh, states, uh, the states of the righteous and the unrighteous are juxtaposed or opposite of each other, um, with the word eternal applied to the final state of both, so both being eternally something. Um, Jesus said that the righteous will enter into eternal life, but the unrighteous will in enter into eternal punishment. Um, although the word eternal may mean quality of life, the concept most certainly includes the notion of unlimited duration. So further consistent rules of biblical interpretation necessitate that the duration of the life of the righteous, which is deemed eternal, be equally applied to the duration of the punishment of the wicked, also called eternal. So there you go. Last verse, these go away into eternal punishment. So it's talking about some will go to eternal punishment. In other words, eternally, they're going to have a punishment. Um, talking about the sinners, obviously, um, but the righteous to eternal life. So the word eternal is used for both. The punishment is going to be eternal. They're going to resurrect to eternal life. So the argument that, you, you know, giving God's going to give them eternal life is wrong because eternal life is only for the uh, for the righteous is is um, is debunked by this verse because it's saying eternal punishment and the other one is eternal life. So to in the in the scheme of things, eternal punishment is not eternal life. They're different. Eternal punishment is some kind of death it's a form of death it's it's the worst form of death and eternal life is a different state but they're both eternal so um so that's it um sorry if this offends you um, but we've got to give it like it is you know i mean we all um you know if we don't have christ or if we don't live um you know uh, the the you know after the love of God and trying to be, um, trying to uh, live, a, live a sinless life, um, could all be here. It's not something that I'm happy about, right? I'm not saying that I'm going to be happy to see anybody in hell or that I want any money to be in hell um, or any of those things. It's something that's mind-boggling to me. Uh, it's scary. It's not uh, something to joke about. And it's horrible and this should spur every christian to to push further to preach the gospel to reach as many people as possible because this is real and we can't ignore the possibility at least that you could be wrong and this could be real and if it is real then hopefully you can 
do what you can to preach the word because that's our responsibility is to preach the word, teach the word, reach out to people, and hopefully they will change their minds and accept Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. So the love of Christ uh, and the love of God through Christ is this salvation opportunity that's a free gift. That's not something that you have to earn or anything like that, um, but you have to get it out there. You know, how are they going to learn unless you preach and teach? Um, so regardless of what we believe, uh, we need to know that this could be the truth. We could be wrong. And if we're wrong, it's better to take, um, what's the saying? Um, the saying is, um, you uh, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. I think is a good way of take, you know, of handling this. Um, let's hope for the best, right? Let's hope that that's, you know, that that's where we're maybe possibly reading it wrong. But let's prepare for the worst. If it is true that this is what's going to happen, then we need to do our job and preach and teach and do what we can because we could be wrong and this could be real. Honestly, I accept it already, but I'm just taking the, the, the other position and putting my shoe, my feet in the other shoe and saying, hey, look, maybe we should, you know, take this as a possibility. And if that's true, then we need to do what we can to preach the word. Um, and if I'm wrong, right, let's say that I'm wrong and my viewpoint is just radical and mean and horrible. Um, at least I did what I could to believe what was the worst possibility and ran with that. Um, and maybe I you know, believed too uh, harshly or too, uh, you know, that God would do something like that. But I think my heart trying to save people and teach people and using that as motivation um, would not be a negative. It would be a negative if you believed that it was not this way and it made you lackadaisical um, and not push as hard as you should to teach the word. Um, then that would be a problem. If that's keeping you from teaching because it's not a big deal and all of that, but if this spurs you, you know, to want to teach more and preach more and, and, and reach more um, because it's the truth, it, it's not a bad thing. Um, and we don't understand God. He understands things way better than we do. And um, we need to do what we can to teach others. And that's it. I hope you guys have a great day, a great week. Uh, and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.